This is a book titled The Silent Master, Meher Baba. And it was sent to Baba. It is the highlights of his life. It was uh, done, I finished it in 1967. It took about six months to do the book. And in 1967, when I sent it to him, it arrived in his hand on the anniversary of when he began silence. So he had been silent for about 44 years at that time. I stand corrected that when he dropped his body and he passed out of his body, it was 44 years that he was silent. Uh, I said 42, but that was uh, only up to the time that I sent him the book. Then it was 42 years. Now that we've got that straightened out, uh, we'll start with the book. This is uh, the highlights. Anyone who reads this book is going to read the highlights of the amazing things that Mayor Baba did in his life that nobody lives a life like that. You find anybody that can live a life even near it, you, you can let me know. I'd like to hear that. But it didn't happen. And uh, I, uh, so I put this book together and I sent it to Mayor Baba in 1967 where he received it in his hand and then when he got it, he liked it so much. And he wrote back to me what he had to say that it was some that this book would be for posterity it would be for all time and uh, if you ever get this book and I'm sure it'll be something that you would treasure because the, the, the things that he gave and what he did in this book uh, is to be treasured I mean you can treasure it it's titled the silent master Meher Baba and I will recite what it says. It's compiled by me, Erwin Luck, and the first uh, part, there's a beautiful picture of Baba, and he's saying, there is no creature who is not destined for the supreme goal, as there is no river which is not winding its way to the sea. When you, real light appears, this darkness, which you think is light, disappears. This is the final account that Meher Baba gave. When the goal of life is attained, one achieves the reparation of all wrongs, the healing of all wounds, the righting of all failures, the sweetening of all sufferings, the relaxation of all strivings, the harmonizing of all strife, the unraveling of all enigmas, and the real and full meaning of all life, past, present, and future. Mayor Baba. Through ages of darkness and suffering, Mankind awaits me in my truth. I and the truth which I bring are inseparable, one from the other. I have not come to establish any cult, society, or organization, nor even to establish a new religion. The religion that I shall give teaches the knowledge of the one behind the many. The book that I shall make people read is the book of the heart that holds the key to the mystery of life. I shall bring about a happy blending of the head and the heart. I shall revitalize all religions and cults and bring them together like beads on one string. This now is Mayor Baba's universal message. I have come not to teach, but to awaken. Understand, therefore, that I lay down no precepts. Throughout eternity, I have laid down principles and precepts, but mankind has ignored them. 
man's inability to live God's words makes the avatar's teaching a mockery. Instead of practicing the compassion he taught, man has waged crusades in his name. Instead of living the humility, purity, and truth of his words, man has given way to hatred, greed, and violence. Because man has been deaf to the principles and precepts laid down by God in the past, in this present avataric form, I observe silence. You have asked for and been given enough words. It is now time to live them. To get nearer and nearer to God, you have to get further and further away from I, my, me, and mine. You have not to renounce anything but your own self. It is as simple as that, though found to be almost impossible. It is possible for you to renounce your limited self by my grace. I have come to release that grace. I repeat, I lay down no precepts. When I release the tide of truth which I have come to give, men's daily lives will be the living precept. The words I have not spoken will come to life in them. I veil myself from man by his own curtain of ignorance and manifest my glory to a few. My present avataric form is the last incarnation of this cycle of time. Hence, my manifestation will be the greatest. When I break my silence, the impact of my love will be universal and all life and creation will know, feel, and receive of it. It will help every individual to break himself free from his own bondage in his own way. I am the Divine Beloved who loves you more than you could ever love yourself. The breaking of my silence will help you to help yourself in knowing your real self. All this world confusion and chaos was inevitable, and no one is to blame. What had to happen has happened, and what has to happen will happen. There was and is no way out except through my coming in your midst. I had to come. And I have come. I am the Ancient One. God has been everlasting, working in silence, unobserved, unheard, except by those who experience His infinite silence. Things that are real are given and received in silence. Now, these are the messages that Mayor Baba gave on his silence. When I speak, it will be only one divine word. This word will have to be hearkened by the heart and not merely by the mind. It will go home to you and bring you the awakening. I am not limited by this form. I use it like a garment to make myself visible to you. And I communicate with you. Don't try to understand me. My depth is unfathomable. Just love me. I eternally enjoy the Christ state of consciousness. And when I speak, I shall manifest my true self. Besides giving up general push to the whole world, I shall lead all those who come to me toward light and truth. I intend, when I speak, to reveal the one supreme self which is in all. This accomplished the self as a limited, 
separate entity will disappear and with it will vanish self-interest. Cooperation will replace competition. Certainty will replace fear. Generosity will replace greed. Exploitation will disappear. The benefits that shall accrue to different nations and countries when I bring about the spiritual upheaval will be largely determined by the amount of energy each possesses. The greater the energy, however misapplied, the greater the response. When I break my silence, the greatest miracle of all times will happen. Be worthy to receive the divine grace. The moment I break my silence and utter the original word, the first and last miracle of Baba in this life will be performed. When I perform that miracle, I won't raise the dead, but I will make those who live for the world dead to the world and live in God. I won't give sight to the blind, but will make people blind to illusion and make them see God as reality. My mission is to utter this word of truth which will pierce the mind of the world and go to its very heart. It will convey the simple truth in its utter and indefinable simplicity. It will mark the fulfillment of the divine life. It will bring new hope to despairing humanity. Although I appear to be silent, I speak through you all. I am ever silent and everlastingly speaking. But the time has arrived when soon I will break this apparent silence and then those who love me will see my real self. Remember that although I do not perform miracles, I will give anything to whosoever asks from the bottom of his heart. But this I tell you too that the one who asks for my love will be the chosen one. My word of words will touch the hearts of all mankind, and spontaneously this divine touch will instill in man the feeling of oneness of all fellow beings. This feeling will supersede the tendency of separateness, and rule over the hearts of all, driving away hatred, jealousy, and greed that breeds suffering and happiness will reign. When I break my silence, it will not be to fill your ears with spiritual lectures. I shall speak only one word, and this word will penetrate the hearts of all men and make even the so-called sinner feel that he is meant to be a saint, while the saint will know that God is in the sinner as much as he is in himself. This much I can say now, that soon God will make me break my silence, and then it will mean God manifesting himself. And within a short period, humiliation and glorification will come, and then will follow my violent physical death. I will come back again after 700 years. This I can say now. When I speak that word, I shall lay the foundation for that which is to take place during the next 700 years. The evolution of consciousness will have reached such an apex that materialistic tendencies will be automatically transmuted into spiritual longing. And the feeling of equality in universal brotherhood will prevail. This means that opulence and poverty, literacy and illiteracy, Jealousy and hatred, which are in evidence today in their full measure, will then be dissolved through the feeling of oneness of all men. 
prosperity and happiness will then be at their zenith. The word that I shall speak will go to the world as from God, not as from a philosopher. It will go straight to its heart. I am never silent. I speak eternally. The voice that is heard deep within the soul is my voice. The voice of inspiration, of intuition, of guidance. To those who are receptive to this voice, I speak. Come prepared to receive not so much of my words, but of my silence. Drown all sound in my silence, if you would hear my word of words. My outward silence is no spiritual exercise. It has been undertaken and maintained solely for the good of others. My silence and the imminent breaking of my silence is to save mankind from the monumental force of ignorance and to fulfill the divine plan of universal unity. The breaking of my silence will reveal to man the universal oneness of God, which will bring about the universal brotherhood of man. My silence had to be. The breaking of my silence has to be soon. I will break my silence when on the one hand, science reaches its highest level, and on the other hand, anti-God elements rise to their peak. Accordingly, my spiritual manifestation will also be of the highest. What will happen when I break my silence is what never has happened before. I perform no miracles and will perform none until I manifest on breaking my silence. Then I will perform the one miracle whose greatness and glory you cannot even imagine and which will benefit not only those around me, but the whole world, each and every being in consciousness. Of my own, I shall not break my silence. Universal crisis will make me do so. When the crisis reaches its absolute culmination, it will make me utter the word at that moment. Circumstances are converging and fast gathering momentum toward precipitating the right moment, which will come completely unawares at any time, hour, any day. That moment is not far away. When I break my silence, the world will come to know whom the world is waiting for. Because all forms and words are from the primal sound or original word and are continuously connected with it and have their life from it, when it is uttered by me, it will reverberate in all people and creatures, and all will know that I have broken my silence and have uttered that sound or word. The effective force of this word in individuals and their reaction to it will be in, ac in accordance with the magnitude and receptivity of each individual mind. The reaction will be as instantaneous and as various as the reaction of people in a room through which a cobra suddenly and swiftly passes. When some would nervously laugh, some lose control of their bowels, and some feel great courage or reasonless hope and joy. The one word full of meaning has produced innumerable meaningless words. And when I utter that word, all words will have meaning. I must break my silence soon, 
When I do, all who have come into contact with me will have some glimpse of me. Some will see a little of it, some a little more, and some still more. It will be as when the powerhouse is switched on. Wherever bulbs are connected to it, there will be light. From the bulbs that are of small candle power, the light will be dim. From those who are of high candle power, the light will be bright. If the bulb is fused, there will be no light at all. I perform no miracles, but when I break my silence, the first and the last miracle will be performed. The time for the powerhouse to be switched on is so near that the only thing that will count now is love. If my silence cannot speak, of what avail would be speeches made by the tongue? My silence and the breaking of my silence at the appointed time will make silent those who talk of everything but God. My silence must break. There is no escape for it. I shall, I shall not lay down my body till I have given the word to the world. That completes the part where Baba spoke about what will happen, how we will know when he breaks his silence, and, what each, and how each person will either benefit from it uh, when he does that. I have come down to your level, and if on that level you love me with all your heart in it, you will come to my real level of the highest because I am in you all. Although I am present everywhere eternally in my formless infinite state, from time to time I take form and the taking, taking of the form and leaving it is termed my physical birth and death. The avatar appears in different forms under different names, at different times, in different parts of the world. As his appearance always coincides with the spiritual birth of man, so the period immediately preceding his manifestation is always one in which humanity suffers from the pangs of the approaching birth. When man seems more than ever enslaved by desire, more than ever driven by greed, held by fear, swept by anger, when more than ever the strong dominate the weak, the rich oppress the poor, large masses of people are exploited for the benefit of the few who are in power, when the individual finding no peace or rest seeks to forget himself in excitement, Immorality increases, crime flourishes, religion is ridiculed, class and natural, national hatreds are aroused and fostered, wars break out, humanity grows desperate when there seems to be no possibility of stemming the tide of destruction. At this moment, the avatar appears. Being the total manifestation of God in human form, he is like a gauge against which man can measure what he is and what he may become. He trues the standard of human values by interpreting them in terms of divine human life. He is interested in everything, but not concerned about anything. The slightest mishap may command his sympathy. The greatest tragedy will not upset him. He is beyond the alterations of pain and struggle, life and death. To him they are all equally illusions, which he has transcended, but by which others are bound, and from which he has come to free them. He uses every circumstance as a means to lead others towards realization. 
He knows that men do not cease to exist when they die and therefore is not concerned over death. He knows that destruction must precede construction, that out of suffering is born peace and bliss, that out of struggle comes liberation from the bonds of action. He is only concerned over unconcern. In those who contact him, he awakens a love that consumes all selfish desires in the flame of the one desire to serve him. Those who consecrate their lives to him generally become identified with him in consciousness. Little by little, their humanity is absorbed into his divinity, and they become free. Those who are closest to him are known as his, as his circle. Every master has an intimate circle of 12 disciples, who in point of realization are made equal to the master himself, though they differ from him in function and authority. In avataric periods, the avatar has a circle of 120 disciples, all of whom experience realization and work for the liberation of others. Their work is not only for contemporary humanity, but for posterity as well. The unfoldment of life and consciousness for the whole avataric cycle, which has been mapped out in the creative world before the avatar took form, is endorsed and fixed in the formative and material worlds during the avatar's life on earth. The avatar awakens humanity to a realization of its true spiritual nature, gives liberation to those who are ready, and quickens the life of the spirit in his time. For posterity is left the stimulating power of his divinely human example. The nobility of a life, uh, of a life supremely lived, of a love unmixed with desire, of a power unused except for others, of a peace untroubled by ambition, of a knowledge undimmed by illusion. He has demonstrated the possibility of a divine life for all humanity, of a heavenly life on earth. Those who have the necessary courage and integrity can follow when they will. Those who are spiritually awake have been aware for some time that the world is at present in the midst of a period such as always precedes avataric manifestations. Even unawakened men and women are becoming aware of it. From their darkness, they are reaching out for light. In their sorrow, they are longing for comfort. From the midst of the strife into which they have found themselves plunged, they are praying for peace and deliverance. For the moment, they must be patient. The wave of destruction must rise still higher, must spread still further. But when from the depths of his heart, man desires something more lasting than wealth, something more real than material power, the wave will recede. Then peace will come, joy will come, light will come. The breaking of my silence, the, si the signal for my public manifestation, is not far off. I bring the greatest treasure which it is possible for man to receive, a treasure which includes all other treasures, which will endure forever which increases when shared with others. Be ready to receive it. Meher Baba. Meher Baba with the poor and the lepers. Let these words be inscribed in your heart. Nothing is real but God. Nothing matters but love for God. When I bow down, 
It is neither for show or as an expression of humility. I do it for my love for humanity. Today, I bow down to these poor from Arangang. They are very poor, but they have great love for me. I have sent them word to obey me today and to let me serve and worship them in my own way. When you see me washing their feet and wiping them dry, and when I put my forehead to their feet and give them four rupees each as a prasad, a gift, I am the poorest of the poor. Since I began to observe silence in July of 1925, I have not touched money except when I give it to the poor and the must. There is no need for me to act or, a, or to keep up appearances. When I come to this plane, I become everything in the entire material universe. Just as you see me as a man, so an ant simultaneously sees me as an ant. Just so, I am the poor of Arangan too. When you realize your own self, you will find that nothing such as this poor program has taken place. Nothing has ever happened or will ever happen. There is no such thing as time. The present moment is from the beginningless beginning. I will bow down to the saints whom I adore, the must whom I worship, and the poor to whom I am wholeheartedly devoted. Nothing makes me more happy than to bow down to God in all these forms. I like bowing down to people rather than being bowed down to. To serve and worship God all around me is most at my heart. When I, with my own hands, give food and clothing to the poor, the result will be that the world will gain its economic and material welfare. When I give the mad and the lepers a wash, the effect will be that those of subnormal consciousness and, though, and lepers will either get cured or their future births will be greatly minimized. I am the poorest of the poor, I say that and really am that, emperor and beggar, at one and the same time. None should hesitate to come to me and embrace me with love. I have only love to give and all I want is love. I want every one of you to make me yours, as you already eternally are mine. To love God in the most practical way is to love our fellow beings. If, if we feel for others in the same way as we feel for our own dear ones, we love God. If instead of seeing faults in others, we look within ourselves, we are loving God. If instead of robbing others to help ourselves, we rob ourselves to help others, we are loving God. If we suffer in the suffering of others and feel happy in the happiness of others, we are loving God. If instead of worrying over our own misfortunes, we think of ourselves more fortunate than many, many others, we are loving God. If we endure our lot with patience and contentment, accepting it as his will, we are loving God. If we understand and feel that the greatest act of devotion and worship to God is not to hurt or harm any of his beings, we are loving God. To love God as he ought to be loved, we must live for God and die for God. 
knowing that the goal of life is to love God and find him as, your, as our own self. Mayor Baba. I am the ocean and can absorb all your burden. According to the law that governs the universe, all suffering is your own labor of love to unveil your real self. Don't lose heart, but keep me in your heart. And remember, I am always with you. These now are the sayings of Mayor Baba. We are all one. The feeling of our being otherwise is due to ignorance. There is greater valor in conquering the heart of a single enemy than in gaining victory over the bodies of thousands of enemies. The mind is capable of turning the bitterest enemy into the sweetest friend by constantly thinking well of him. Keep your mind quiet, steady, and firm. Do not submit to desires, but try to control them. One who cannot restrain his tongue cannot restrain his mind. One who cannot restrain his mind <coughs> cannot restrain his action. One who cannot restrain his action cannot restrain himself. And one who cannot restrain himself cannot attain his real infinite self. Honesty will guard you against false modesty and give you the strength of true humility. True humility is strength, not weakness. It disarms antagonism and ultimately conquers it. Be greedy to own more and more wealth of tolerance and justice. Be angry with none but your own weakness. In the spiritual life, there is no room for compromise. Don't run away from the world. Run away from your own lower self. Don't renounce the world. Renounce your own lower self. Don't seek solitude anywhere but within your own self. The source of eternal bliss is the self in all. The cause of perpetual misery is the selfishness of all. God is your innermost self. Do not look for God outside of you. Silently cry out within your own self, Beloved one, reveal yourself to me as my own real infinite self. You have not to give up your religion, but give up clinging to the outer husk of mere ritual and ceremonies. The heart of man has always been the ancient temple for the worship of the ancient one. Nothing can house the ancient one that does not house love. Love God completely and he will solve all your difficulties. Faithfully leave everything to him and he will see to everything. Love God sincerely and he will reveal himself to you. This love needs no ceremonies and show. Your heart must so love that even your mind is not aware of it. There is no difference in the realization of truth either by a Muslim, Hindu, Zoroastrian, or a Christian. The difference is only in words and terms. Truth is not the monopoly of any re particular race or religion. God has come again and again in various forms, has spoken again and again in different languages, the same one truth. 
Instead of making truth the vital breath of life, man compromises by making over and over again a mechanical religion of it, a handy staff to lean on in times of adversity, a soothing balm for his conscience, or a tradition to be followed. How many Christians follow Christ's teaching to turn the other cheek or to love thy neighbor as thyself? How many Muslims follow Muhammad's precept to hold God above everything else? How many Hindus bear the torch of righteousness at all costs? How many Buddhists live the life of pure compassion expounded by Buddha? How many Zoroastrians think truly, speak truly, act truly? The aim of life is to love God. The goal of life is to become one with God. To do this, you have not to renounce the world, but to renounce the low desires, dishonesty, and hypocrisy. Then in the midst of activities you will be loving God as he should be loved. There is nothing that love cannot achieve, and there is nothing that love cannot sacrifice. Pure, real love longs to give and does not ask for anything in return. God does not listen to the language of the tongue. He does not listen to the language of the mind. He responds to the language of the heart. There is nothing beyond God, and there is nothing without God. Yet God can always be captured with love. As stated by a seer, wealth may be sacrificed for health, wealth and health for self-respect and all three for one's own religion. But to gain God, everything, including religion, should be sacrificed without hesitation. God is not far from the seeker, nor is it impossible to see him. He is like the sun, which is ever shining right above you. It is you who have held over your head the umbrella of your variegated mental impressions, which hide him from your view. You have only to remove the umbrella, and the sun is there for you to see. It does not have to be brought there from anywhere. But such a tiny and trivial thing as an umbrella can deprive you of the sight of such a stupendous fact as the sun. The perennial spring of imperishable sweetness is within everyone. One must contact the ocean of unfading bliss within. The truth of divine life is not a hope, but a reality. It is the only reality, and all else is illusion. All that lives is striving for happiness, yet a thousand and one pains and fears attend upon every pleasure which man seeks through the ignorance of exclusiveness. It is better to deny God than to defy God. Not through desperate self-seeking, but through constant self-giving is it possible to find the self of all selves. Have love and you will conquer the lower and limited self of cravings that veil your own true being as God. Give without thought of return. Serve without thought of reward. God is everywhere in everything. Most of all, he is right within yourself. From the beginning of all beginnings, I have been saying, I say it now, and to the end of ends I will say it, that he who loves God becomes God. Live only to find and realize your true identity with your beloved God. 
Every one of you has the infinite within you. And yet, because of ignorance, everyone feels some kind of helplessness. To realize God is to attain liberation from the bondage of illusion. Be brave. Be happy. I and you are all one, and the infinite that eternally belongs to me will one day belong to every individual. I bring to man divine love and, and life eternal. I am that ancient one whose past is worshipped and remembered, whose present is ignored and forgotten, and whose future advent is anticipated with great fervor and longing. The eyes of man see things that are not worth seeing, and that which is real is not seen by physical eyes. To ask for purely intellectual proof of the existence of God is like asking for the privilege of being able to see with your ears. Mind cannot reach that which is beyond it. God is infinite and beyond the reach of mind. God's imagination begets universal mind, universal energy, and universal body, in which are contained the individual minds, individual energies, and individual bodies of everything and every being in creation. Truth can be realized only by transcending the entire realm of imagination. All achievements, through progress in science or otherwise, are but a superficial exploration of that which is without. If that which is within be realized, the root of all that is without is made bare. And may it will realize and experience that everything, em that everything emerges from within him as the shadow of his infinite self. People generally think that the blind are unfortunate. You may also think so, but it is people with eyesight who are truly unfortunate. They think that all the things they see are real, but never see God, who is real. He who seeks my pleasure finds the divine treasure. I am the Ancient One and the slave of those who really love me. Pure love is matchless in majesty, it has no parallel in power, and there is no darkness it cannot dispel. There is no sadhana greater than love, there is no law higher than love, and there is no goal beyond love. God and love are identical. As long as man remains ignorant of his divine self, he's, he may as well be a stone. A man lives, a stone exists. Both remain ignorant of the truth. Let your life itself be my message of love and truth to others. Birth and deaths are illusory phenomena. One really dies when one is born to live as God. The eternal beyond both birth and death. Whether you are dreaming dreams in sleep, dreaming the dream of life on earth, dreaming acute hell or heaven states after leaving the gross body, or dreaming the real dreams of the higher spiritual planes, essentially you remain the same. Everything and everyone represents God in one way or another in some state of consciousness or another. But the God-man 
The avatar Buddha Christ Rasul represents God in every way and everything, everywhere, in one and all states of consciousness, manifest or latent. What I say is not words of intellect. They are not words coming from the mind, but from experience of the beyond. Truth has to be experienced, and for that one has to go beyond mind. Survival after death is as true as death after life. To end a ceaseless succession of lives and deaths, death itself has to be annihilated in life. On annihilating death in life by completely freeing consciousness of all illusion, man becomes God in the naked truth of his own true existence. The universe is the outcome of nothing. It is under the influence of maya, which is ignorance, is full of many, and so is false. As long as many is seen, the one cannot be seen. The one God is seen when this phantom universe disappears, and this universe ceases to exist for one when the lower self of that one is annihilated. This is truth, but intellect cannot grasp it. Wisdom cannot weigh it. Space cannot hold it. Time cannot check it. Angels cannot fathom it. But human beings can realize it through love, the divine love, love for the Almighty, except whom nothing is. The universe is the grinding mill, and the truth realized master is like its central pin. None can escape the repetitive and eternal crushing that goes on in this grinding mill, except those grains which adhere to the central pin. My continuous experience is that I am an everyone and everything. This experience is the height of all experiences. This state of mind cannot be understood with the help of the mind. God does everything without doing anything. I am infinite consciousness interpenetrating and transcending all states of limited consciousness. The most primal or the most final category of consciousness, say a stone or a saint, are equal distance from me, so I am approachable to all. I am the way. The beyond state is achieved when one gets real knowledge. It cannot be attained with the mind. All of a sudden knowledge comes as swiftly as the lightning bolt which burns to ashes all that it falls upon. This knowledge of roots illusions, doubts and worries and apparent sufferings are instantaneously replaced by everlasting peace and eternal bliss which is the goal of all existence. Let us not hope because this knowledge is beyond hoping and wanting. Let us not reason, because this knowledge cannot be comprehended or thought of. Let us not doubt, because this knowledge is the certainty of certainties. Let us not live the life of the senses, because the lusty, greedy, false, impure mind cannot reach this knowledge. Let us love God as the soul of our souls, and in the height of this love lies this knowledge. The divinely perfect ones can bestow this knowledge on anyone they like and whenever they like. The one and only God who resides equally in us all is approachable by each one of us 
through love. To draw you to me and to make you realize you are bliss itself. I come amongst you and suffer infinite agony. Not only do perfect masters not use their divine power to avoid or alleviate their own physical suffering, which they consciously experience as illusion, but they take upon themselves physical suffering in order to alleviate the spiritual ignorance of others. Although he knows himself to be identical with God and is thus eternally free, he also knows himself to be one with other souls in bondage and is thus vicariously bound. And though he continuously experiences the eternal bliss of God-realization, he also vicariously experiences suffering owing to the bondage of other souls whom he knows to be his own forms. An ordinary man suffers for himself. Masters suffer for humanity. And the avatar suffers for one and all beings and all things. Everlastingly, with all the divine bliss within me, I eternally suffer for one and all. Thus, I am eternally crucified for all. The perfect ones who retain normal consciousness and the body after realizing the unchanging and absolute truth dwell eternally in divine love which transcends all the duality and surpasses all understanding. They enjoy abiding and unassailable peace for they have at last arrived at the final goal of creation. Through unfathomable ways, I lead you to liberation. I am the ancient one, come to redeem the modern world. You say you see me in dreams? These dreams arrive from, arise from your own impressions formed through your love and faith in me. I have come into your midst to awaken you from the long drawn out dream of illusion, not to create more dreams for you. The eternal truth has three aspects, knowledge, power, and bliss. The realization of these threefold divinity or truth is the target of the seeker. Those who are on the path of love bask in eternal joy. Those who are on the path of action take refuge in eternal power. Those who seek wisdom rely on eternal knowledge. But at the end of the path, all have to come to the indivisible completeness of the truth in all its aspects, however their different paths may have been. One who arrives at the goal is the truth-realized individual, and he becomes the very source of infinite knowledge, infinite power, and infinite bliss. While wine leads to self-oblivion, divine love leads to self-knowledge. Not by fruitless surveys of the past, nor by elusive longings for the future, nor by enslavement to the fleeting moment, but by staking everything for God, is it possible for you to experience yourself as the illimitable ocean of love? Here and nowhere else is the final solution of all your problems. 
Know that you are in essence eternal and heirs to infinite power, knowledge, and bliss. In order to enjoy your unlimited state, all that is necessary is to shed your ignorance, which makes you feel that you are separate from the rest of life. The separative ego, or I, can disappear only through divine love, which will be my gift to mankind. Unless one learns to love in its true sense, one cannot cross the hurdle of the mind. From one to understand love in its true sense, the only recourse is to dedicate oneself to the Lord of love and to hold fast under all circumstances to the feet of the perfect master. To love those whom you cannot love is to love me as I should be loved. It does not require a large eye to see a large mountain. Though the eye is small, the soul which sees through it is greater and vaster than all the things which it perceives. It is so great that it includes all objects, however large or numerous, within itself. For it is not so much that you are within the cosmos as that the cosmos is within you. The world is a kindergarten and school necessary for the spiritual lessons man must learn through countless lives of experiencing the opposites, such as pain and pleasure, joy and suffering, good and bad, wealth and poverty. All growth is gradual, and it's only through slow and gradual stages that man truly grow, begins to grow up and discover his true self, and to relinquish the childish playthings of hate, greed, and anger. In the divine scales, vice and virtue are necessary experiences man goes through before attaining the supreme balance of self-realization, which is beyond all opposites, good and bad. There are two who do not have any use for religion, the materialist and the one who is self-realized. There are two who are indifferent to money, the sot and the one who is self-realized. There are two who are free from lust, the child and the one who has attained truth. Through, though the truth-realized person appears to be similar in the above respects to the materialist, the saint, and the child, he stands completely apart from all these. He has attained unity with the infinite existence of God while the others have not. I do not interfere with any religion and permit all to follow unhindered their own creeds. When compared with love for God, external ceremonials have no value. Love for God automatically and naturally results in self-denial, mental control, and ego annihilation. The world will soon realize that neither cults, creeds, dogmas, religious ceremonies, lectures, and, and sermons on the one hand, nor on the other hand, in ardent seeking for material welfare or physical pleasures, can ever bring about real happiness. But only selfless love and universal brotherhood can do it. Those who want to be consumed in love 
should go to the eternal flame of love. God is for those who are not for themselves. Unless you give up the breath of your desire and die to yourself, you cannot make me the breath of your life and live forever. God may be compared to the sandalwood. It continuously emits a sweet scent in all directions. Though only those who take the trouble to go near it have the benefit of its charming fragrance. Truth is but one, the same and eternal. However, I have come not to teach it, but to give it. Every second in eternity, every one of us is the same one indivisible God who has no second ever. By loving and serving the least of mine, you are loving and serving me. Feed me and clothe me and tend me in the poor. I am the ocean of love. So whatever you do with love pleases me. Everything else may fail. Love never fails. Most people play with illusions as children play with toys. The soul wants to experience some miracles or spectacular phenomena, or in more advanced stages, wants to perform miracles and manipulate phenomena. Even spiritually advanced persons find it difficult to outgrow this habit of playing with illusions. Spare no pains to help others. Seek no other reward than the gift of divine love. Yearn for this gift sincerely and intensely. And I tell you with my divine honesty that I will give you more than you ask for. We must lose ourselves in order to find ourselves. Thus loss itself is gain. We must die to self to live in God. Thus death means life. We must become completely void inside to be completely possessed by God. Thus complete emptiness means absolute fullness. The only miracle of a perfect one is to make others perfect too. To make them realize the infinite state which he himself enjoys. That is a real miracle. Otherwise, miracles have nothing to do with truth at all. The truth which I want you to share with me is not opinion or belief, but of direct experience which knows no contradiction and which will make you realize that nothing in this world is worth being greedy about and that there need not be any hatred, jealousy, or fear. Physical pleasures can never bring about real happiness, but that only selfless love and universal brotherhood can do it. Real happiness lies in making others happy. I have come down from the highest to your level, so take me to be yours and you become mine. Love can belong to all high and low, rich and poor, everyone of every caste and creed can love God. When you love, you give. When you fall in love, you want. Love is pure as God. It gives and never asks. 
If you have a single thought of self, your service is not selfless. Spare no pains to help others. Seek no other reward than the gift of divine love. Yearn for this gift sincerely and intensely, and I promise in the name of my divine honesty that I will give you much more than you yearn for. When everything goes wrong, the mind becomes helpless, and it has to rely entirely on the heart. These are the moments when you resign to my will and so rely solely on my help and you are relieved. My bliss and my infinite sense of humor sustain me in my suffering. The amusing incidents that arise at the expense of none lighten my burden. If instead of erecting churches, fire temples, mandirs and mosques, people were to establish the house of God in their hearts for their beloved God to dwell in supreme, my work will have been done. If instead of mechanically performing ceremonies and rituals because of age-old customs, people were to serve their fellow beings with the selflessness of love, taking God to be equally residing in one and all, and knowing that by so serving others, they are serving me, my work will have been fulfilled. If those who love me will just for one minute as now be silent in their minds just before they go to bed and think of me and picture me in the silence of their minds and do that regularly, then this veil of ignorance that we have will disappear. And this bliss that I speak of, and which all long for, we shall experience. One who has attained infinite bliss can make thousands perfect like himself. When you leave all to me, I dare not neglect you, and you get relief from your predicament. I am the ocean of love and compassion. I am the only one who loves everyone. No one loves me as I should be loved. He who knows everything displaces nothing. To each one I appear to be what he thinks I am. There is only one question to ask, and once you know the answer to that question, there are no more to ask. This section is at the feet of the Master. A woman of 90 years who had waited so many years to meet her master, Baba said tenderly through his alphabet board, I too am old, older than the earth. A German artist who brings some of his paintings to Baba, he says he has seen you before face to face, but does not remember where. Baba says, tell him, I have known him for a very long time. He has a feeling that he knows you, Baba says, and I love him. There is no need for explanation. Is it a link already established? Baba replies, yes, and I will help him spiritually. It was his desire to meet you for a very long time, Baba says again, no need to explain, I know. A sadhu is a seeker who had spent 15 years in penance in the mountains. 
He told Baba he had long wished to have his darshan, his presence. Baba told him, I am in your heart. A man was introduced to Baba and all his qualifications enumerated. Baba said, I am unmindful of all these qualifications you have. The only qualification which I want you to have is love. I see to whether one loves me or not. You love me and I am pleased with you. A young man was introduced to him in the USA as a farmer, to which Baba replied, I am a farmer too. I till the universe. A woman bearing gifts. Baba says to her, Why do you bring me all these gifts? It is not necessary. Only love counts. Baba does not need these things. In giving them to Baba, you place a burden on him. Give them instead to someone who needs them. I do it because I love you, Baba. Baba replies, Isn't it enough to bring me your love? You are poor. But Baba, I must express my love for you. Baba says, If you must express your love, then give in my name to the poor. He added, I give not what people want, but what they need. The woman later remarked that Baba gives selfhood, of his divine self. A married lady who has a very good nature. Baba says, she has a very good heart. I wish it could be better. Baba says, this longing is good and this contact will make it better as she wishes. I will help her spiritually. She will feel it. A man presents a written statement, confessions of the confused state of his life, which makes him believe that he has fallen and is utterly broken. Baba says, I know, no need to tell me, and I will explain. Don't worry. When one is meant for spiritual advancement, one has either love or lust to the extreme. This lust must be converted into love. What is lust but a craving of the physical senses? And love is the craving of the soul. I know all about you and will spiritually help you. Never, never think that you have fallen so as not to rise again. A woman was introduced to Baba as the greatest marksman of her day. Baba smiled as he dictated on his alphabet board. I too am a great marksman. I shoot hearts with my arrows of divine love. A delicate woman who comes with her son. Baba conveys, I am also an artist. I have the whole world as my canvas. I paint souls. A lady interested in human welfare. She was silent. Baba says, ask her if she wants to speak about anything with me. She nodded refusal. Baba says, I understand. Because what can explanations mean when interior help is at hand? Real help is spiritual help and not words and explanations. She feels, I will help her. The visitor lays her hand in Baba's and sits there for about a minute. Then he asks her to leave and with his usual sign, and she goes away much affected. A man who has lost an eye. Baba asks, any questions? What he craves for is the contact, 
Questions, therefore, are unnecessary. Baba says, yes, it is true. If it is true that I know everything, then there is no need to ask me. And if you feel I do not know, what is the use of asking me? He has no doubts as to your powers and knowledge. I will help him spiritually. I like him very, very much. He has gone through terrible times and struggles, Baba says. I know. He has a very good heart, and my help will make him understand. A woman who has suffered much. She is at a very awkward moment. She has fights within and fights without, illnesses and difficulties in her profession. She does not believe in herself. Baba says, my help will make her believe in herself too. And that's the most beautiful thing in life, to have confidence in oneself. Can that really be done, she asks, surprised. Baba says, yes, I will help her and everything will change. Is she condemned to be alone as she feels now? Baba replies, no. When the outlook is changed, she won't feel alone anymore. A psychologist, he comes. Baba says, wonderful soul, I know. And for him, there is no need to explain in words. He understands because it is the feeling that matters and not words. He will do a great work in, in the future for humanity. I will help spiritually. To a sailor, Baba says, I am the ocean. Everything gets dissolved and drowned in it. A man who has read yoga books and is a pupil of one who proclaims himself to be a leading master. Is he right to call himself such? Everyone has a right to call himself what he likes. It is for others to accept or challenge it. It depends on his living rather than teachings. A daughter of a clergyman. She wants to believe in you and have faith in you. Baba says, but why? If what you want is within, you will find it only there. And my aim is only to help you find it, whether you follow me or not. She says, but it is difficult. Baba replies, I will help you, even if you don't want it. When the sun is high up and you feel hot, you cannot avoid it. It shines on you even if you don't want it. It is a question of going out of yourself to help others. This contact will help you greatly. My blessings. The son of one of Baba's disciples asks, How could I have happiness? Baba replies, I am the source of happiness, the sun of all bliss. But there is a curtain that veils you from the sun, and you do not see it. Now, because of your inability to see, owing to the curtain, you cannot say there is no sun. The sun is there, shining and spreading its luster all over the world. But you do not allow its rays to approach you obstructing them with the veil of ignorance. Remove that and you will see the sun. I will help you to tear open the curtain and enable you to find happiness with it. I love you. I love you all. I am the eternal child and they in their happy play are my playmates. I am a child whose playground is the universe. All beings and things are my toys in my divine game. 
Compared to my being and power, all are inanimate toys. But they are toys which I inspire with my life-giving love. All are equally me, and I reside in each always. The whole of life is like playing a game of hide-and-seek in which you must find your real self. I enjoy games, chiefly cricket, playing marbles, flying kites, and also listening to music. I will say what I have to say in very few words. I love children and never feel more happy than to be amongst them. I would prefer to have time to play with them rather than have all this garlanding puja arti, especially since I am expert in playing marbles. Ages ago when I woke up, I began to play marbles with the universe. They come to me because I am also a child. Just as there are masters and instructors to guide you along the path of your studies, so there are perfect masters who can guide you along the path uh, of the spirit to the glorious destination of Godhood. Few have the good fortune to meet and follow such a spiritual guide. When you do, you must earn his grace and be worthy of his love. Love can attain what the intellect cannot fathom. Wherever I am, wherever you are, I am always with you. Having seen me with your eyes, you have still not seen me as I am. You have not even had a glimpse of my true being. I belong to no religion. Every religion belongs to me. My personal religion is my being the ancient infinite one. And the religion I impart to all is love for God, which is the truth of all religions. These are the seven realities given by Meher Baba. Mayor Baba gives no importance to creed, dogma, caste systems, and the performance of religious ceremonies and rites, but to the understanding of the following seven realities. Number one, the only real existence is that of the one and only God who is the self in every finite self. Number two, the only real love is the love for this infinity of God, which arouses an intense longing to see, know, and become one with its truth. Number three, the only real sacrifice is that in which, in pursuance of this love, all things, body, mind, position, welfare, and even life itself are sacrificed. Number four, the only real renunciation is that which abandons, even in the midst of worldly duties, all selfish thoughts and desires. Number five, the only real knowledge is the knowledge that God is the inner dweller in good people and so-called bad, in saint and so-called sinner. This knowledge requires you to help all equally as circumstances demand, without expectation of reward. And when compelled to take part in a dispute, to act without the slightest trace of enmity or hatred. To try to make others happy with brotherly or sisterly feeling for each one. To harm no one, 
in thought, word, or deed, and not even those who harm you. Number six. The only real control is the discipline of the senses from indulgence in low desires, which alone ensures absolute purity of character. Number seven, the only real surrender is that in which the poise is undisturbed by any adverse circumstance and the individual amidst every kind of hardship is resigned with perfect calm to the will of God. Do not ask God for money, fame, power, health, or children, but seek his grace, and it will lead you to eternal bliss. This is the discourse Mayor Baba gave when he came to America. Since arriving in America, I have been asked many times, what solution have I brought to the social problems now confronting you? What did I have to offer that would solve the problems of unemployment, prohibition, crime, that would eliminate the strife between individuals and nations and pour a healing balm of peace upon a troubled world. Now I'm going to put my glasses on so I can see this. This is small print here. The answer has been so simple that it has been difficult to grasp. The root of all our difficulties individual and social, is self-interest. It is this, for example, which causes corruptible politicians to accept bribes and betray the interest of those whom they have been elected to serve, which causes bootleggers to break for their own profit a law designed, whether wisely or not, to help the nation as a whole, which causes people to connive for their own pleasure at the breaking of that law, thus causing disrespect for law in general and increasing crime tremendously, which causes the exploitation of the great masses of humanity by individuals or groups of individuals seeking personal gain, which impedes the progress of civilization by shelving inventions which would contribute to the welfare of humanity, simply because their use would mean the scrapping of present inferior equipment which when people are starving causes the wanton destruction of large quantities of food simply in order to maintain market prices, which causes the hoarding of large sums of gold when the welfare of the world demands its circulation. But the elimination of self-interest even granting a sincere desire on the part of the individual to accomplish it is not so easy and is never completely achieved except by the aid of a perfect master for self-interest springs from the false idea of the true nature of the self. And this idea must be eradicated and the truth experienced before the elimination of self-interest is possible. I intend when I speak to reveal the one supreme self which is in all. This accomplished, the idea of the self as a limited, separate entity will disappear and with it will vanish self-interest. 
Perfect masters can impart divine knowledge, bestow divine love, and shower the grace of God union by a mere t glance, touch, or single divine thought. God alone is real, and all else is illusion. Posing Saints In the spiritual realm, there are countless sadhus, saints, and yogis, though the number of, the number of genuine ones are very limited. Do not pose as being pious, because God is everywhere. God cannot be fooled. So why pose as being something you are not? There are today many so-called saints, who even though they tell people to be honest and not hypocritical, are yet themselves deep in dishonesty. Remember, therefore, if you cannot lead a saintly life, at least do not make a show of it, because the worst scoundrels are better than hypocritical saints. It is not what the world thinks about us that matters, but what God knows about us. They might try to imitate me, the God-man, and many of the external things associated with the life of the God-man, but they cannot, by the very nature of their spiritual limitations, really imitate the God-man in possessing perfect understanding, experiencing infinite bliss, or wielding unlimited power. These attributes belong to the God-man by, by virtue of his having attained unity with God. Money. I would know him truly rich, who owning nothing, possesses the priceless treasure of his love for God. His is the poverty that kings could envy, and that makes even the king of kings his slave. Love needs no propaganda. You need love yourselves in order to propagate love amongst others. Beauty, money, position, worlds, universes, are as valueless as a zero in comparison with God, who alone is worth seeing and becoming. At different times in the past, there have been various institutions here at Maribad. There have been dispensaries, a hospital, schools, shelters for the poor, and the mus, who are spiritually advanced. All were run free and were open to people, irrespective of their caste, creed, or class. I make the best use of money when I have it, and dissolve everything when I have none. Gifts of love I accept with love, and I disperse them with love. I maintain no institutions on a permanent basis, such as those run elsewhere by self-perpetrating organizations. Every heart that loves me continues, regardless of the presence or absence of institutions, to remain my ashram, which is my home for my work. When I first set foot in Maribad, I had nothing. But in the course of my subsequent activities here and elsewhere, over 10 million rupees must have been spent for my work. Today I have nothing. I give no value to money for the sake of money. No one could ever win godhood from me in exchange for all the money in the world. But he who loves me intensely can become God without possessing a single cent. Money has absolutely no connection with love, and love is the only thing of real value. The eternally changeless one resides 
in everything that eternally changes. Drugs. Just as it is difficult to distinguish an imitation from a real pearl, so it is difficult to distinguish between an imitation and a real spiritual experience. Once gained, the real experience is never lost. It is permanent. The experiences which drugs induce are far removed from reality as a mirage is from water. No matter how much you pursue the mirage, you will never quench your thirst. And the search for truth through drugs must end in disillusionment. Many people in India smoke hashish and ganja. They see colors, forms, and lights, and it makes them elated. But this elation is only temporary. It gives only experience of illusion and serves to take one further away from reality. A yogi taught his 150 students to go into a trance. When the students came out of the trance, they were asked by the yogi to describe their experiences. Their accounts would be amazing to the man in the street, for, the, for in their state of trance, they saw lights and colors galore, dazzling lights in colors and in circles and in different designs. They felt all things around them pulsating with life and felt themselves separate from their own bodies and became witness to all things. Even such experiences are not continuous. However, these are not spiritually harmful, but neither are they spiritually beneficial. But experiences induced through the use of drugs are harmful. The only real experience is to continuously see God within oneself as the infinite effulgent, effulgent ocean of truth. And then to become one with this infinite ocean and continuously experience infinite knowledge, power, and bliss. If God could be experienced through drugs and cigarettes, God is not worthy of being God. Taking LSD is harmful physically, mentally, and spiritually. But if you take me into your heart and love me as your real self, you will find me in you as the infinite ocean of effulgence. And this experience will remain conti continuously throughout eternity. Politics. I have no connection with politics. All religions are equal to me, and all castes and creeds are dear to me. But though I appreciate all isms, religions, and political parties for the many good things they seek to achieve, I do not and cannot belong to any of these isms, religions, or political parties. For the absolute truth, while including them, transcends all of them and leaves no room for separative divisions, which are all equally false. The divine life embraces in its being one and all, including the members of the animal and vegetable kingdom. World peace cannot be ensured through dogmas, however learned, or organizations, however efficient. It can be ensured only by a release of unarguing and unconquerable love, which knows no fear or separateness. Humanity is not going to be saved by any material power, nuclear or otherwise. It can be saved only through divine intervention. God has never failed humanity in its dark and critical periods. 
The greatest danger to man today is not from any natural catastrophe, but from himself. It is not possible to realize human brotherhood merely by appealing to high ideals or to a sense of duty. Something more than that is essential to release human consciousness from the clutches of selfishness and greed. Today, the urgent need of mankind is not sex or organized religions, but love. Divine love will conquer hate and fear. It will not depend upon other justifications, but will justify itself. I have come to awaken in man this divine love. It will restore to him the unfathomable richness of his own eternal being and will solve all of his problems. Know that you are in essence eternal and heirs to infinite knowledge, bliss, and power. I tell you with my divine authority that you and I are not we, but one. Existence. The one and eternal existence is always there throughout the countless and varied aspects of life. Existence is all-pervading and is the underlying essence of all things, whether animate or inanimate, real or unreal, varied in species or uniform in forms, collective or, or individual, abstract or substantial. In the eternity of existence, there is no time, there is no past and no future, only the everlasting present. In eternity, nothing has happened and nothing will ever happen. Everything is happening in the unending now. Existence is substance, whereas life is a shadow. Existence is eternal whereas life is perishable. Existence is God, whereas life is illusion. Existence is reality, whereas life is imagination. Existence is everlasting, whereas life is passing. Existence is unchangeable, whereas life is ever-changing. Existence is freedom, whereas life is a binding. Existence is indivisible, whereas life is multiple. Existence is imperceptible, whereas life is deceptive. Existence is independent, whereas life is dependent on mind, energy, and gross forms. Existence is, whereas life appears to be. Existence, therefore, is not life. Throughout all ages, satyrs and seekers, sages and saints, munis and monks, yogis, sufis, and talibs have struggled during their lifetime undergoing untold hardships in their efforts to extricate themselves from the maze of actions and to realize the eternal existence by overcoming life. They fail in their attempts because the more they struggle with their self, the firmer the self becomes gripped by life. Through actions intensified by austerities and penances, by seclusions and pilgrimages, by meditation and concentration, by assertive utterances and silent contemplations, by intense activity and inactivity, by silence and verborosity, 
by jappers and tappers, and by all types of yogas and chilas. Emancipation from the grip of life and freedom from the labyrinths of actions is made possible for all and attained by a few when a perfect master is approached and his grace and guidance are invoked. I have emphasized in the past, I tell you now, and I shall, age after age, forevermore repeat that you shed your cloak of life and realize existence, which is eternally yours. The Five Perfect Masters There are only five perfect masters. And these five bring me down to this earth. The present five perfect masters will come into public recognition after I drop my body. I never come of my own wish. It is always the five perfect masters who bring me down in each avataric period. Those five hold the key to all of creation, which contains an infinite number of universes. It is because of the five perfect masters that I appear here before you. They fetch me down, and I experience myself as everything, and I tell you that I am everything. In spite of appearing as five different men, they are and always remain one God. As each one has exactly the same supreme experience of God consciousness. Nevertheless, in external relations with the world, each shows a different personality with his own characteristics, traits, tastes, nature, habits, and ways of dealing with people. Perfect masters are not necessarily recognized as such in the world. They too often meet with opposition and have to share persecution from the masses born of ignorance. However, in general, they meet comparatively little opposition, particularly when their function as masters remains more or less unknown. But the avatar, who is God incarnate, must always face the headache of severe opposition. It occurs in every avataric yuga, cycle of divine manifestation. Zoroaster, Rama, Krishna, Buddha, Jesus, Muhammad, all had to face it. The same picture is before my eyes today. All the five sad gurus, Perfect masters put together mean Baba. I have come so that you can escape from the cage of Maya, the principle which makes illusion appear as reality. When the five perfect masters bring me down, they draw a veil over me. Although Baba John was in the form of a woman, she was one of them and she unveiled me in my present form. With just a kiss on the forehead, between the eyebrows, Baba John made me experience thrills of indescribable bliss, which continued for about nine months. Then one night, in January 1914, she made me realize in a flash the infinite bliss of self-realization. It was Baba John who caused me in less than the flesh of a second to experience my most original state of being the Ancient One. Baba John, whom I often call the Emperor, was really the Emperor of Emperors. She lived most of the time under a neem tree in the cantonment area of Pune staying there through all seasons, regardless of sun, rain, or cold. The infinite bliss 
of my self-realization was, is, and will remain continuous. At the moment, I experience both infinite bliss as well as infinite suffering. Once I drop the body, only bliss will remain. But after I became self-conscious, I could not have said all this. Nor could I say it, even now, if it had not been for the indescribable spiritual agonies which I passed through for another period of nine months in returning to normal consciousness of the suffering of others. During those nine months, I remained in a state which no one else could have tolerated for even nine days. The conscious state of God is known only to those who have achieved it. Such a state of realization of divine oneness is completely beyond the domain of mind itself. It is rare for a man to become superconscious. One in millions might achieve it. It is rarer still for the God conscious to be able to return with God consciousness to normal consciousness of all the illusory existences, gross, subtle, and mental, as a perfect master. Although the infinite bliss I experienced in my superconscious state remained continuous, as it is now, I suffered agonies in returning toward normal consciousness of illusion. Occasionally, to gain some sort of relief, I used to knock my head so furiously against walls and windows that some of them showed cracks. Later on, in April of 1915, I also began to go for long distances on foot or by vehicle. At Ketagon, for the first time, I came in physical contact with Narayan Maharaj, one of the five perfect masters. I traveled as far north as Nagpur and saw Tajudan Baba, another of the five perfect masters. Tajudan Baba of Nagpur was completely indifferent to his immediate surroundings. He was Taj, the crown. You can have no idea who he was. I do know he, who he is. People used to crowd around him during his lifetime and still flock around his shrine by the thousands. Finally, in December of 1915, I felt impelled to call on Sai Baba, the perfect master among masters. You will never be able to understand thoroughly how great Sai Baba was. He was the very personification of perfection. If you knew him as I know him, you would call him the master of creation. During his lifetime, there were few who really loved him. Despite the crowds, I intuitively prostrated myself before him on the road. When I arose, Sai Baba looked straight at me and exclaimed, Parvardigar, meaning God Almighty Sustainer. Maharaj was the only one there who knew who Sai Baba was. Maharaj himself was so great that if his grace were to descend on a particle of dust, it would be transformed into God. At that time, Maharaj was reduced almost to a skeleton due to his fast on water. He was also naked and surrounded by filth. When I came near enough to him, Maharaj greeted me, so to speak, with a stone which he threw at me with great force. It struck me on my forehead, exactly where Baba John had kissed me. 
hitting with such force that it drew blood. The mark of that injury is still on my forehead. But that blow from Maharaj was the stroke of divine knowledge. Figuratively, Maharaj had started to rouse me from sound sleep. But in sound sleep, man is unconscious, while I, being superconscious, was wide awake in sound sleep. With that stroke, Maharaj had begun to help me return to ordinary consciousness of the realm of illusion. That was the beginning of my present infinite suffering in illusion, which I experience simultaneously with my infinite bliss in reality. But it took me seven years of acute struggle under Maharaja's active guidance to return completely to and become established in normal human consciousness of the illusion of duality, while yet experiencing continuously my superconsciousness. The more normally conscious I became, the more acute my suffering grew. For years, therefore, I continued to knock my head frequently on stones. That was how I eventually lost all my teeth. For through the constant knocking, they became prematurely loose. This also resulted in a wound, which was constantly fresh, and therefore I always used to keep a colored handkerchief tied around my forehead. Several years later, after becoming almost three-fourths normally conscious, while retaining full superconsciousness, I went to Sakari and stayed for six months in 1921 near Maharaj. At the end of this period, Maharaj made me know fully what I am, just as Baba John had made me feel in a flash what I am. During those six months, Maharaj and I used to sit near each other in a hut behind closed doors almost every night. On one such occasion, Maharaj folded his hands to me and said, Merwan, you are the avatar and I salute you. At that time, both Baba John and Maharaj began telling various people, referring to me, that the child is now capable of moving the whole world at a sign from his finger. Once in May of 1922, Maharaj addressed a large gathering of the Mandali, which was his disciples, and said, listen to me most carefully. I have handed over my key, my spiritual charge, now to Merwan. And henceforth, you are to stick to him and do as he instructs you. With God's grace, you will soon reach the goal. Still others, Maharaj asked individually to follow me. Baba John gave me divine bliss. Sai Baba gave me divine power. Upasni Maharaj gave me divine knowledge. Sai Baba made me what I am. Baba John made me feel what I am. And Yupasni Maharaj made me know what I am. All five of these perfect masters have brought me down. And all that I have become is due to these five. I am made of all the attributes of all five of these masters. And my avataric state comprises the five states of these five sad gurus, these five perfect masters. I don't need my glasses now. The print is big. And when you get the book, you'll see it for yourself. Ignorance believes the cosmos is a reality. Birth, death, old age, 
wealth, honor are real. Knowledge knows the cosmos is a dream. God alone is real. This is the dream of life. I definitely know from my living experience that God is the one and only reality and that all else is illusion. All that you see and hear at this moment, this whole, are being in each other's presence. These explanations which I give and you hear are even, and even my incarnation as the avatar, all this is a dream. Every night you go to sleep and have different kinds of dreams. Yet every morning you wake up to experience anew the same old dream that you have been dreaming since your birth into your present life in illusion. You will say, Baba, we are wide awake. We actually see you sitting before us. We can and we do follow what you are explaining to us. But you will admit that you would say the same thing to me if in a dream you found that you were near me and heard me telling that all you felt, saw, and heard was a dream. As long as you do not wake up from a dream, you are dream-bound to feel it to be stark reality. A dream becomes a dream only when you wake up. Only then do you tell others that the life you lived in the dream was just a dream. Good or bad, happy or unhappy, in reality the dream is then recognized as having been absolutely nothing. Therefore, I repeat that although you are sitting before me and hearing me, you are not really awake. You are actually sleeping and dreaming. I say this because I am simultaneously awake in the real sense and yet dreaming with one and all the dreams which all dream. All your pleasures and difficulties, feelings of happiness and misery, your presence here and your listening to these explanations, all are nothing but a vacant dream on your part and mine. There is this one difference. I also consciously know the dream to be a dream while you feel that you are awake. When you really wake up, you will know at once that what you felt to be wakefulness was just dreaming. Then you will realize that you and I are and always have been one in reality. All else will then disappear, just as your ordinary dreams disappear on waking. When they not only cease to exist, but they are found never to have really existed. It is only when you wake up in the true sense that you find that you alone exist and that all else is nothing. Only after cycles and cycles of time can one attain one's own conscious state of God and find that one's infinite consciousness is eternally free of all illusion of duality. The whole of creation is a play of thoughts, the outcome of the mind. It is your own mind which binds you and it is also the mind which is the means of your freedom. You are eternally free. You are not bound at all. But you cannot realize your freedom by merely hearing this from me because your mind contrives to entangle you in the illusion of duality. Therefore, you only understand what I am telling you. And mere understanding cannot make you experience 
the truth which I tell you. For ages past, I have been telling people to leave all and come to me. That alone is the way to liberation from all illusion. When the internal eye is opened, God, who is the object of search and longing, is actually sighted. These are the seven planes of higher consciousness by Meher Baba. Each stage of advancement is a state of consciousness. Advancement from one state of consciousness to another proceeds with the crossing of the inner planes. Thus there are six intermediate planes and states of consciousness to be experienced before reaching the seventh plane, which is the end of the journey where there is realization of the God state. The first plane. When the pilgrim arrives at the first plane, he experiences his first merging, which consists of the minor annihilation of the ego. The pilgrim has temporarily lost his limited individuality and experiences bliss. Many pilgrims who thus, who thus get merged in the first plane think they have realized God and get stuck in the first plane. But if the pilgrim keeps himself free from self-delusion or comes to realize that his attainment is really a transitional phase in his journey, he advances further on the spiritual path and arrives at the second plane. The, se the merging into the second plane is called the annihilation of the false. The pilgrim is now absorbed in bliss and infinite light. Some think they have attained the goal and get stranded in the second plane. But others who keep themselves free from self-delusion march onwards and enter the third plane. The merging into the third plane is called the annihilation of the apparent. Here the pilgrim loses for days all consciousness of the body or the world and experiences infinite power. But since he has no consciousness of the world, he has no occasion for the expression of his power. This is the state of divine coma. Consciousness is now completely withdrawn from the entire world. If the pilgrim advances still further, he arrives at the fourth plane. The merging into the fourth plane is called the annihilation leading toward freedom. The pilgrim experiences a peculiar state of consciousness at the fourth plane. Since he now not only feels infinite power, but has plenty of occasions for the expression of that power. He can now know everything. He can, for example, know what anyone situated in any part of the globe is thinking or doing. Further, he has not only occasions for the use of his powers, but has a definite inclination to express them. If he falls prey to this temptation, he goes on expressing powers and gets caught up in the alluring possibilities of the fourth plane. The fourth plane is for this reason one of the most difficult and dangerous planes to cross. The pilgrim is never spiritually safe and has always the possibility of, of a reversion until he has successfully crossed the fourth plane and arrived at the fifth plane. The merging into the fifth plane is called the annihilation of all desires. 
here the incessant activity of the lower intellect comes to a standstill. He does not think in the ordinary way. Yet he is indirectly a source of many thoughts inspired in others. He sees, but not with the physical eyes. Mind speaks with mind, and there is neither worry nor doubt. He is now spiritually safe and beyond the possibility of a downfall. And yet many a pilgrim on this exalted plane finds it difficult to resist the delusion that they have attained godhood. In his self-delusion he thinks and says, I am God, and believes himself to have arrived at the end of the spiritual path. But if he moves on, he perceives his mistake and advances to the sixth plane. The merging into the sixth plane is called the annihilation of the self in the beloved. Now the pilgrim sees God directly and clearly as an ordinary person sees the different things of this world. This continued perception and enjoyment of God does not suffer a break even for an instant. Yet he does not become one with God, the infinite. If the pilgrim ascends to the seventh plane, he experiences the last merging, which is called the final annihilation of the self in God. Through this merging, the pilgrim loses his separate existence and becomes permanently united with God. He, not, he is now one with God and experiences himself as being none other than God himself. The seventh plane is the terminus of the spiritual path, the goal of all search and endeavor. It is conscious Godhood. It is the only real awakening. The pilgrim has now reached the other shore of this vast ocean of imagination and realizes that this last truth is the only truth and that all other stages on the path are entirely illusory. He has arrived at the final destination. Serve him who serves the whole universe. Obey him who commands the whole creation. Love him who is love itself. Godhood is the birthright of every man. It is possible through love for man to become God. And when God becomes man, it is due to his love for his beings. The seventh plane of God-realization. When a person attains God-realization, he has infinite power, knowledge, and bliss. And these intrinsic characteristics of inner realization are the same in all God-realized persons. God-realization is the very goal of all creation. All earthly pleasure, howsoever great, is but a fleeting shadow of the eternal bliss of God-realization. All mundane knowledge, howsoever comprehensive, is but a distorted reflection of the absolute truth of God-realization. All human might, howsoever imposing, is but a fragment of the infinite power of God-realization. All that is noble, beautiful, and lovely, all that is great and good and inspiring in the universe, 
is just an infinitesimal fraction of the unfading and unspeakable glory of God-realization. The eternal bliss and absolute truth, the infinite power and the unfading glory of God-realization are not to be had for nothing. The individualized soul has to go through the travail of pain and struggle of evolution before it can inherit this treasure which is hidden at the heart of creation. The state of perfection in which the God-man dwells is beyond all forms of duality and opposites. It is a state of unlimited freedom and unimpaired completeness. Immortal sweetness and undying happiness, untarnished divinity, and unhampered creativity. The God-man may be said to be the Lord and servant of the universe at one and the same time, as one who showers his spiritual bounty on all in measureless abundance, he is the Lord of the universe. And as one who continuously bears the burden of all and helps them through numberless spiritual difficulties, he is the servant of the universe. And just as he is Lord and servant in one, he is also the supreme lover and the matchless beloved. The love which he gives or receives goes to free the soul from ignorance. In giving love, he gives it to himself in other forms. And in receiving love, he receives what he has awakened through his own grace, which is continuously showered on all without distinctions. If a person accepts without reserve from the bounty which the God-man showers, he creates a link which will stand by him until he attains the goal of freedom and God-realization. It is better to study God than to be ignorant about him. It is better to feel God than to study him. It is better to ex experience God than to feel God. And it is better to become God than to experience him. The true nature of God in its entirety is known to the aspirant only when he attains unity with God by losing himself into his being. The individual soul has to realize its identity with the supreme universal soul with full consciousness. The real happiness which comes through realizing God is worth all the physical and mental suffering in the universe. Then all suffering is as if it were not. It is not possible for a person to have the slightest idea, not that inexpressible happiness, without actually having the experience of Godhood. The happiness of God-realization is self-sustained, eternally fresh and unfading, boundless and indescribable. And it is for this happiness that the world has sprung into existence. My existence is for this love and truth. And to suffering humanity I say, have hope. I have come to help you in winning the one victory of all victories, to win yourself. Mayor Baba and the must. Musts are those who become permanently unconscious in part or whole of their physical bodies, actions, and surroundings. 
due to their absorption in their intense love and longing for God. Ordinarily, it is very difficult, and curiously, it is impossible to distinguish between a madman and a must. One is actually mad, and the other appears to be mad internally, the two are poles apart. The mad has lost the power of correct reasoning. The must has transcended the limitations of intellect. A madman is mentally infirm. A must is spiritually enlightened. The mad have distorted ideas about their bodies and surroundings. The must have an utter disregard for theirs because their hearts directly experience inner, tr inner truths beyond the gross sphere, and they are more or less imbued with God love. I and those who come with me on a must trip keep moving night and day for weeks at a time without regular or good meals and only rarely do we rest for a night. I soon give away whatever I have chosen to receive, except what I receive from the must. Even if they give me rags or waste paper, I treasure them. My love for the must is similar in many ways to that of a mother who continues to look with love after her children regardless of their behavior. To make the child clean, a mother does not even mind soiling her hands with the child's stool. I am the mother of the muss. If God were not there, there would be no muss. They are also like parts of my body. Some are nose, ears, and eyes for me. I am helpful to them and they are helpful to me. The must alone know how they love me, and I alone know how I love them. I work for the must, and knowingly or unknowingly, they work for me. God does not read what your pen writes. He hears what your heart sings. Mind stopped is God. Mind working is man. Mind slowed down is must. Mind working fast is mad. These are those who bear witness. These testimonies about Mayor Baba have been given by spiritually advanced souls, known as musts. They are highly evolved and have reputations as musts or saints, quite independent of their relationship with Baba. Mayor Baba explains that these musts are God intoxicated. They are immersed in divine bliss and as such are in a different state of consciousness than the ordinary person. As well as experiencing the loveliness of God, they also have, according to their degree of advancement, divine knowledge and power. They are true men of God and love God desperately. They have no concern with the mundane affairs of the world and are found in India and Ceylon, often in remote places. An important part of Mayor Baba's work over the years has been gathering together the mus. He would either have them brought to him or he would go to them. When a must would bear witness to Baba's spiritual greatness, he would in most cases do so without ever previously met or heard of the master. Agora Baba, a must from Simla in August of 1946, 
He told Kaka, pointing to Baba, you will see what will come to pass, and one day you will know who he really is. Azim Khan Baba, a Muslim Mutra, on October 14th of 1946, when Meher Baba contacted him, he said, You are Allah. You have brought forth the creation. And once in a thousand years, you come down to see the play of what you have created. Bowala Baba, an adept pilgrim of Boer, on January 1947, he said of Baba, Mayor Baba has in him the whole universe. He is the master of everyone, and he is within every disciple. He is this world, that which is above it and below it. He is in me and in everyone. He is the saint of saints. He is Tajudan Baba. In one glance, he sees the whole continent of India. My Sahib, a woman must, in Sukhar, on June 1924. She asked Ramju who his spiritual master was. He told her, Mayor Baba. And she replied, King, King of Kings. Malana Ulma, an adept pilgrim on February 1942. This aged saint was contacted at night and was roused from sleep to see Baba. When he, ga when he gazed at Baba, he said, in the darkness of the night, I see the light of God. Mayan Sahib, a very advanced must in November 1944. When Baba came, Mayan Sahib embraced him and weeping aloud cried out, you became free and then allowed yourself to be bound. This is a reference to Baba who having become one with God, came back to the world of his own free will for the sake of mankind. Baramanji Must, an adept pilgrim of Mulana, in October 14th, 1946. He touched Baba's feet and said, Behold, how devoted love draws the Lord Krishna to me. The perfect master is here. Chadi Baba, a high must from Negapatam. In June of 1940, he said, One day, while pouring earth over his head, there will be much trouble and privation, and many will die of starvation. But Baba will assuage the suffering of the world. In March 1941 in Kedah, he said, there will be so great a calamity in the world that no one can imagine it. Even brother will kill brother. And, t and there will be great tribulation. Then all the world will think of my big brother. At that time, Baba will draw aside the veil and all will pay obeisance to him. In June or July 1941, in Ajmer, he told a disciple, you want to leave, don't you? Well, what's the good of it? All the world is in Baba's power. So where will you go? Where will you go to? Serve him now. He is the ocean. Because one day, when lots of people throng to see him, you may never get the opportunity of meeting him. 
Dada Main, a must of Amirati, in April of 1939. Chogan tried to bring this must to Baba in Jabalpur. He refused to come and said, He is the emperor. How can I come? <laughs> Muhammad, one of Baba's five favorite musts, he always called Baba Dada. He has said many things about Baba, of which the most uh, striking are, Dada is God. Dada is master. Everything depends on Dada's will. Because Dada is there, the world is there. Dada is the master of mercy. Muhammad Ali must a must from Wadha in uh, July of 19 July 19th 1944 Bedul who went to see him first had a stick with him that Baba had given him the must said to him the man who gave you the stick is very great, so look after the stick and hit no one with it. Nadir Ali Shah, the spiritual chargeman of Kedah, 1941. He refused to come to Baba's contact saying, my boat will be drowned in that ocean. Pir Fazi Shah, an adept pilgrim, on the 12th of October, 1946. He told Baba, No one until you came has touched my heart with the arrow of divine love. You have the power to destroy and flood the whole world. No one knows fully the limits of your greatness. You are the spiritual authority of the time. And if I were to die, I would take another body to be close to you. Nikanwala must in Hardwar on the 4th of July in 1958. The must took special care to offer Baba a seat, saying, please sit here. Sometimes he praised Baba, saying, We play with you, we speak with you, we take food with you, and we make jokes with you in our ignorance. Gokala Baba, the must from Jamalpur, on the 9th October 1946, when Baba visited him for the last time, Gakola Baba looked lovingly at Baba and said, God has come. Gulab Baba, a must of Elechkor, in March of 1939. When Baba entered the room, Gulab Baba told Kaka, pointing to Baba, He is God himself. And you have tricked me. A few moments later, when Baba asked Gula Baba to sit beside him, he protested, I, can, I am not fit to sit beside him. <laughs> Gurdat Singh, an advanced pilgrim, on the 29th of July, 1929. This Sikh was standing by the roadside. He told Ramju, pointing to Baba, he is a master, he is a real master, and his grace has been bestowed upon me. Finally, he said, may I be sacrificed in the dust under his feet. Keshwanji Maharaj, an adept pilgrim. Keshwanji, after looking at the picture of Baba, called Baba's disciple and told him that he normally never let anyone come near him, but seeing this photo and knowing the divinity of Mayor Baba, he had to call him near 
because Baba was the master of the universe and bore the burden of the whole creation upon his shoulders. Kali Must, a high woman must, in May of 1939. She was brought to Baba by a disciple and told Baba, you are the ocean, give me a few drops from it to drink. A very high must in Jamanpur, January in 1941. Baba contacted him twice, and the second contact was at night in the countryside, beyond the town. During this second contact, the must wept loudly and then cried out, I have met God in the wilds. An initiate pilgrim of Panjani into 26 October 1941, he met Baba on the road and said, You are God Vishnu, Avatar. Pray grant me the boon of a master's word for me to remember and repeat. A few minutes later he said, My work is done and then added, Here no one knows you. I have seen you and recognized you as the true avatar of Vishnu. Pray you remember me also. Baba told him, through one of his disciples who was with him, I know all. That is why I came to you here now. The man then folded his hands and bowing said, My life's desire is fulfilled. Hail God Vishnu. A must, a place of seclusion in May of 1946. He was brought to Baba's house. And when he reached the gate, he said, We have come to the garden of paradise. Baba came out of the house, and he gazed at Baba's face, laughed with tears of joy in his eyes, and embraced Baba. Pointing to Baba, he said to those standing by, Look at this man's face and forehead. They shine as if the sun were there. Can't you recognize who he is? Love me as I want you to and you will find your own self is nothing but God. I am the one so many seek and so few find. No amount of intellect can fathom me. No amount of austerity can attain me. Only when one loves me and loses oneself in me am I found. These are three true love stories by Meher Baba. The first is Kalyan. Emperor Janak, Sita's father, was also a perfect master. During his reign, there was a youth from outside his empire who longed desperately to see God. I must see him. He said as clearly as I see these external things. And he decided to see Janik and ask his help. For two months he walked through sun and rain without food. This was about 7,000 years ago. There were no automobiles and airplanes then. Finally he arrived at the courtyard of Janik's palace. The guards accosted and stopped him. He stood outside the wall, crying aloud for Janik, shouting his name, his glory, and his fame. At last Janik heard him and asked his ministers to inquire who he was. I am a lover of God, he replied. I want to see God. Janik must show me God. Janik had him brought in and said to his ministers, Throw him in prison. So he was thrown into jail. The youth thought, This Janik, who calls himself all-knowing, must know I am seeking God, yet he sends me to prison. 
after a few days, <laughs> during which the youth had no food nor drink, Janik ordered him to be brought to audience. Janik saluted him with folded hands and ordered his ministers to give him a bath, to feed him, and to treat him like a prince. He was brought to the palace and seated on Janik's throne. He let him enjoy this state for three days, said Janik. The youth did not grasp what Janik had in mind. And of course he did not know how to manage the affairs of state. Poor people came begging. Ministers came for advice. He didn't know what to do, so he kept quiet. Finally, he appealed to the ministers to ask Janik to free him from this uncomfortable position. Janik came, ordered him to get down from the throne, and asked him which he preferred, life in prison or on the throne. The boy said, they are both prisons, but of different kinds. Janik directed him to go and to return after 12 years. The youth left the palace, roamed about India, became a rich man, and took the name of Kalyan, which means happy in every respect. After 12 years, he returned to Janik, this time rich and prosperous. The guards again checked him, asking who he was. I am the rich Kalyan, he said. Janik, on hearing this, sent word for him to go away for a few more years. So Kalyan returned home and in the course of time lost everything that he possessed. After 12 months, he returned to Janik and again asked, who again asked who he was. I am the miserable Kalyan, he replied. Janik then sent him away again for 12 more months. During this time, Kalyan started pondering. What is this? When I first went to Janik, I had nothing. But I wanted to see God. Then I was thrown into prison. Then I was placed on the throne. Then I became rich. Then I became poor. What does all this mean? When he returned to Janik's palace after 12 months, one of the guards took pity on him and said, You fool! This time, when Janik asks who you are, say, I don't know. Kalyan followed this advice. Janik then turned his gaze upon him, and he lost consciousness of all bodies of the whole world and became conscious of his own self as the infinite God. This is the story of Manu and Lila as told by Mayor Baba. You have heard of the two lovers, Majnu and Lila. They had human love at its height. Majnu was at a great distance from Lila, always trying to love her and repeating her name wherever he went. But Lila was at some other place. One day a thorn went into Majnu's foot. Blood came out. At the very same moment, Lila felt a shock and blood trickled from her foot. Even such human love falls short of divine love. His whole life was Lila. He saw Lila in everyone. Of course, he was not careful of his clothes, health, food. He roamed about always thinking of her. Then he met a spiritual master sitting under a tree. The master called him saying, if you had tried to love God as intensely as you love Lila, you would have seen God everywhere, in everything. Majnu answered, I am not after God. I am after Lila. I see her in all. 
The master called him, embraced him, and in an instant, Majnu had the experience of God everywhere. This is the story of Saint Mira. Have you all heard of Saint Mira? In India, everyone knows her. People sing the bhajans, sung by Mira in praise of Krishna. Mira, Mira was a very beautiful girl. She was the wife of a royal prince of a wealthy family in North India, who later became king. She loved Krishna with all her heart, but she did not live at the time of Krishna, about 5,000 years ago. Mira lived 200 or 300 years ago. Her husband did not like the way she was going about on the streets, for she was the queen, and queens did not mix with the crowd. She would enter the huts of the poor. The name of Krishna on her lips as she sang. She suffered many trials and threats to test her love for Krishna. She was locked up in a room. Her food was poisoned. A cobra was concealed in a bouquet of flowers. She accepted all as a gift of her Lord Krishna and said, and nothing happened. She, he protected her. She refused to have anything to do with anyone but her Lord Krishna. Finally, the king drove her away. She said, if the king drives me out, I have a place. But if the Lord of the universe is displeased, I have no place. The people turned against her. As years passed, she looked radiant in her rags. Then the king came and fell at her feet. For a man in India to bow down to a woman is a sin to his wife unforgivable. Yet he fell at her feet because she was sincere. When she died, all revered her. And now people repeat her bhajans. I am Lord Krishna. I want all of you to love me as Mira loved me. I am the one who is always lost and found amongst mankind. It is your love for yourself that loses me. And it is your love for me that finds me. Love me above everything. For now, while I am in your midst, I am most easily found as I really am. Twelve ways of realizing me. Number one, longing. If you have that same longing and thirst for union with me, as one who has been lying for days in the hot sun of the Sahara wants water, then you will realize me. Number two, peace of mind. If you have the peace of a frozen lake, then too you will realize me. Number three, humility. If you have the humility of the earth, which can be molded into any shape, then you will know me. Four, desperation. If you experience the desperation that causes a man to commit suicide, and you feel that you cannot live without seeing me, then you will see me. Faith. Number five. If you have the complete faith that Kalyan had for his master in believing it was night, although it was day, because his master said so, then you will know me. Number six, fidelity. 
If you have the fidelity that the breath has in giving you company, even without your feeling it, till the end of your life, that both in happiness and in suffering gives you company and never turns against you, then you will know me. Number seven, control. When your love for me drives away your lust for the things of the senses, then you will realize me. Number eight, selfless service. If you have the quality of selfless service unaffected by results, similar to that of, a, of the sun, which serves the world by shining on all creation, on the grass and the fields, in the birds in the air, on the beasts in the forest, on all mankind with its sinner and its saint, its rich and its poor, unconscious of their attitude toward it, then you will win me. Renunciation, number nine. If you leave for me everything physical, mental, and spiritual, then you have me. Number 10, obedience. If your obedience is as spontaneous, complete, and natural as light is to the eye or smell is to the nose, then you come to me. Number 11, surrenderance. If your surrenderance to me is as wholehearted as then, as one who, suffering from insomnia, surrenders to sudden sleep without fear of being lost, then you have me. Number 12 is love. If you have that love for me, which St. Francis had for Jesus, then not only then not only will you realize me, but you will please me. The time has come. I repeat the call and bid all come unto me. I am equally approachable to one and all, big and small, to saints who rise and sinners who fall through all the various paths that give the divine call. I am approachable alike to saint whom I adore and to sinner whom I am for, and equally through Sufism, Vedantism, Christianity, or Zoroastrianism and Buddhism, and other isms of any kind, and also directly through no medium of ism at all. the highest of the high, consciously or unconsciously, directly or indirectly, each and every creature and every human being in one form or another strives to assert individuality. But when, it, but when eventually man consciously experiences that he is infinite, eternal, and indivisible, then he is fully conscious of his individuality as God. And as such experiences infinite knowledge, infinite power, and infinite bliss. Thus man becomes God and is recognized as a perfect master, sad guru or kutab. To worship this man is to worship God. When God manifests on earth in the form of man and reveals his divinity to mankind, he is recognized as the avatar, the Messiah, the prophet. Thus God becomes man. And so infinite God, age after age, through all cycles, wills through his infinite mercy to affect his presence amidst mankind by stooping down to human level in the human form. But his physical presence amidst mankind 
not being apprehended, he is looked upon as an ordinary man of the world. When he asserts, however, his divinity on earth by proclaiming himself the avatar of the age, he is worshipped by some who accept him as God and glorified by a few who know him as God on earth, but it invariably falls to the lot of the rest of humanity to condemn him while he is physically in their midst. Thus it is that God as man, proclaiming himself as the avatar, suffers himself to be persecuted and tortured, to be humiliated and condemned by humanity, for whose sake his infinite love has made him stoop so low, in order that humanity, by its very act of condemning God's manifestation in the form of avatar, should, however, indirectly assert the existence of God in his infinite eternal state. The avatar is always one and the same, because God is always one and the same. The eternal, indivisible, infinite one, who manifests himself in the form of man as the avatar as the Messiah, as the prophet, as the ancient one, the highest of the high. This eternally one and the same avatar repeats his manifestation from time to time in different cycles, adopting hu different human forms and different names in different places to reveal truth in different garbs and different languages in order to raise humanity from the pit of ignorance and help free it from the bondage of delusions. Of the most recognized and most worshipped manifestations of God as Avatar, Zoroaster was the earliest before Ram, Krishna, Buddha, Jesus, and Muhammad. Thousands of years ago, he gave to the world the essence of truth in the form of three fundamental precepts. Good thoughts, good words, and good deeds. These precepts were and are constantly unfolded to humanity in one form or another, directly or indirectly, in every cycle by the avatar of the age as he leads humanity imperceptibly toward the truth. To put good thoughts, good words, and good deeds into practice is not as easily done as it would appear, though it is not impossible. But to live up to these precepts honestly and literally is as apparently impossible as it is to practice a living death in the midst of life. In the world, there are countless sadhus, mahatmas, mahapurushas, saints, yogis, and walis, though the number of genuine ones is very, very limited. The few genuine ones are, according to their spiritual stature, in a category of their own, which is neither on a level with the ordinary human being, nor on a level with that state of the highest of the high. I am neither a Mahatma nor a Mahapurush, neither a sadhu or, nor a saint, neither a yogi nor a wali. Those who approach me with the desire to gain wealth or to retain their possessions, those who seek through me relief from distress and suffering, those who ask my help to fulfill and satisfy mundane desires, to them I once again declare that as I am not a sadhu, saint, or a mahatma, mahapurush, or yogi, to seek these things through me is to court utter disappointment. Though only apparently, for eventually this disappointment is in itself invariably instrumental 
in bringing about the complete transformation of mundane wants and desires. The sadhu, saints, yogis, walis, and such others who are on the intermediary path can and do perform miracles and satisfy the transient material needs of individuals who approach them for help and relief. The question therefore arises that if I am not a sadhu, nor a saint, nor a yogi, not a Mahapurusha, nor a wali, then what am I? The, the natural assumption would be that I am either just an ordinary human being or I am the highest of the high. But one thing I say definitely, and that is that I can never be included amongst those having the intermediary status of the real sadhus, saints, yogis, and such others. Now, if I am just an ordinary man, my capabilities and powers are limited. I am no better or different th uh, from any ordinary human being. If people take me as such, they should not expect any supernatural help from me in the form of miracles or spiritual guidance. And to approach me to fulfill their desires would be absolutely futile. On the other hand, if I am beyond the level of an ordinary human being, and much beyond the level of saints and yogis, then I must be the highest of the high. In which case to judge me with your human intellect and limited mind, and to approach me with mundane desires would not only be the height of folly, but sheer ignorance as well, because no amount of intellectual gymnastics could ever understand my ways or judge my infinite state. If I am the highest of the high, my will is law. My wish governs the law, and my love sustains the universe. Whatever your apparent calamities and transient sufferings, are they are but the outcome of my love for the ultimate good. Therefore, to approach me for deliverance from your predicaments, to expect me to satisfy your worldly desires, would be asking me to do the impossible, to undo what I have already ordained. If you truly and in all faith accept your Baba as the highest of the high, it behooves you to lay down your life at his feet rather than to, to crave the fulfillment of your desires. Not your one life, but your millions of lives would be but a small sacrifice to place at the feet of one such as Baba. Who is the highest of the high? For Baba's unbounded love is the only sure and unfailing guide to lead you safely through the innumerable blind alleys of your transient life. They cannot obligate me who surrendering their all, body, mind, possessions, which, in, which perforce they must discard one day, surrender with a motive, surrender with a motive, surrender because they understand that to gain the everlasting treasure of bliss, they must relinquish passing possessions. This desire for greater gain is still clinging behind their surrender, and as such, the surrender cannot be complete. Know you all that if I am the highest of the high, my role demands that I strip you of all your possessions and wants, consume all your desires, and make you desire less rather than satisfy your desires. Sadhu saints, yogis, and walis can give you what you want, but I take away your wants and free you from attachments 
and liberate you from the bondage of ignorance. I am the one to take, not the one to give what you want or as you want. Mere intellectuals can never understand me through their intellect. If I am the highest of the high, it becomes impossible for the intellect to gauge me, nor is it possible for my ways to be fathomed by the limited human mind. I am not to be attained by those who, loving me, stand reverently by in rapt admiration. I am not for those who ridicule me and point at me with contempt. To have a crowd of tens of millions flocking around me is not what I am for. I am for the selected few who scattered amongst the crowd silently and unostentatiously surrender their all, body, mind, and possessions to me. I am still more for those who, after surrendering their all, never give another thought to their surrender. They are all mine who are prepared to renounce even the very thought of their renunciation and who, keeping constant vigil in the midst of intense activity, await their turn to lay down their lives for the cause of truth at a glance or sign from me. Those who have indomitable courage to face willingly and cheerfully the worst calamities, who have unshakable faith in me, eager to fulfill my slightest wish at the cost of happiness and comfort, they indeed truly love me. From my point of view, far more blessed is the atheist who confidently discharges his worldly responsibilities accepting them as his honorable duty than the man who presumes he is a devout believer in God, yet shirks his responsibilities apportioned to him through divine law and runs after sadhus, saints, yogis, seeking relief from the suffering which ultimately would have pronounced his eternal liberation. To have one eye glued on the enchanting pleasures of the flesh and with the other expect to see a spark of eternal bliss is not only impossible, but the height of hypocrisy. I cannot expect you to understand all at once what I want you to know. It is for me to awaken you from time to time throughout the ages, sowing the seed in your limited minds, which must in due course and with proper heed and care on your part, germinate, flourish, and bear the fruit of that true knowledge which is inherently yours to gain. If, on the other hand, led by your ignorance, you persist in going your own way, none can stop you in your choice of progress. For that too is progress, which, however slow and painful, eventually and after innumerable incarnations, is bound to make you realize that which I want you to know now. To save yourself from further entanglement in the maze of delusion and self-created suffering, which owes its magnitude to the extent of your ignorance of the true goal, awake now, pay heed, and strive for freedom by viewing ignorance in its true perspective be honest with yourself and God. One may fool the whole world and one's neighbors, but one can never escape from the knowledge of the omniscient. Such is the divine law. I declare to all of you who approach me and to those of you who desire to approach me, accepting me as the highest of the high, that you must never come with the desire in your heart which craves for wealth and worldly gain, but only with the fervent longing to give your all, body, mind, and possessions with all their attachments, 
Seek me not in order to extricate you from your predicaments, but find me in order to surrender yourself wholeheartedly to my will. Cling to me not for worldly happiness and short-lived comforts, but adhere to me through thick and thin, sacrificing your own happiness and comforts at my feet. Let my happiness be your cheer and my comforts your rest. Do not ask me to bless you with a good job, but desire to serve me more diligently and honestly without expectation of reward. Never beg of me to save your life or the lives of your dear ones, but beg of me to accept you and permit you to lay down your lives for me. Never expect me to cure you of your bodily afflictions, but beseech me to cure you of your ignorance. Never stretch out your hands to receive anything from me, but hold them high in praise of me, whom you have approached as the highest of the high. If I am the highest of the high, Nothing is then impossible to me. And though I do not perform miracles to satisfy individual needs, the satisfaction of which would result in entangling the individual more and more into the net of ephemeral existence, yet time and again, at certain periods, I manifest the infinite power in the form of miracles, but only for the spiritual up upliftment and uh, for the benefit of humanity and all creatures. However, miraculous experiences have been experienced by individuals who love me and have unswerving faith in me. And these have been attributed to my nazar or grace on them. But I want you all to know that it does not befit my lovers to attribute such individual miraculous experiences to my state of the highest of the high. If I am the highest of the high, I am above these illusory plays of Maya in the course of the divine law. Therefore, whatever miraculous experiences are experienced by my lovers who recognize me as such, or by those who love me unknowingly through other channels, they are but the outcome of their own firm faith in me. Their unshakable faith often superseding the course of the play of Maya, giving them these experiences, which they, all, which they call miracles. Experiences derived through firm faith eventually do good and do not entangle the individuals who experience them into further and greater bindings of illusion. If I am the highest of the high, then a wish from my universal will is sufficient to give in an instant God-realization to one and all and thus free every creature in creation from the shackles of ignorance. But blessed is knowledge that is gained through the experience of ignorance in accordance with the divine law. This knowledge is made possible for you to attain in the midst of ignorance by the guidance of perfect masters and surrenderance to the highest of the high. Now is the time for all to understand that I am God in human form. Finally, this is the summary of the silence and work of Avatar Mayor Baba. Mayor Baba left his physical body January 31st, 1969. This book has been reproduced as it was when it reached his hand on July 10th of 1967. 
July 10, 1967, marks the 42nd year of Avatar Mayor Baba's silence in which no word, ha no word has passed his lips. The messages, discourses, and sayings which appear in this book uh, and elsewhere have been dictated by Mayor Baba over the years through the medium of a little board with the letters of the English alphabet printed on it by pointing to each letter to spell out words and sentences he would convey his messages to others whether they were individuals or thousands gathered together the disciples of the master are trained to translate his rapid finger movements over the alphabet board into words for others to hear however since 1954 Mayor Baba has done away completely with the use of his board and now restricts all communications to simple hand gestures, which a disciple interprets into words. In his silent way, he relates that he will break his silence. And worldwide transformation of consciousness will take place. He points out that in the distant past, a great push was given that raised life from instinct to reason. In this unique advent of the avatar, life will be relifted from reason to intuition. His message is, when the word of my love breaks out of its silence and speaks in your hearts, telling you who I really am, you will know that that is the word you have always been longing to hear. And again, be composed in the reality of my love. For all confusion and, and despair is your own shadow, which will vanish when I speak the word. As well as not speaking, the master does not touch money except when giving it to the poor and the lepers. On these occasions, he would also bow down to them, wash their feet. He would give them to understand that God was equally in, the, in them as himself. But while they were not conscious of their godhood, he was. He promised to help them. At the time of beginning silence, Mayor Baba wrote a book which remains unseen to this day. Baba relates that this book reveals many spiritual secrets hitherto unknown and will not be released to the world until after he passes from the earth. After completing this manuscript in January of 1927, he laid down his pen and has not written a line since, except for his signature. Despite his self-imposed silence, not touching money, and not writing, Mayor Baba's life is one of intense activity. He has built free hospitals, dispensaries, and schools. The master provided shelters for travelers, the poor and the lepers. Over the years, untold thousands were fed by his hand and given food and cloth to take home. People of all nationalities, classes, and creeds, including untouchables, mingled freely together, and many lived and worked together under the Master's direction. One of the characteristics of Baba's activity is the manner in which he would suddenly and without warning stop a project in the parent mid-career, regardless of the success it was experiencing. One explanation he has offered was through an example. When one has to erect a large building, a temporary scaffolding is erected. When the building is completed, the scaffolding is removed. The school, hospital, and buildings were but the scaffolding for my real inner work. Now that that is finished, the scaffolding has to go. Baba explains that it is his inner work that benefits all mankind. And this, he points out, 
is the work of real significance. He would often go into seclusion in a tiny hut, a cave, or some isolated place for days, weeks, or months together. Even his own disciples would not be permitted to see him. His instructions for them were to take turns standing watch to make sure no one disturbed him. During these periods, he would often take no food except for a few sips of water or a glass of milk once every 24 hours. One fast and seclusion of this type lasted five and a half months. Mayor Baba relates that the higher planes of consciousness are not accessible to the ordinary man, but the God-man or avatar is master of these planes and uses his unlimited power, knowledge, and bliss in behalf of others still in the bondage of ignorance. It is when his inner work becomes especially intense that he retires into such seclusions. Mayor Baba's work has also included personally bathing hundreds of the mad and caring for them, even to the point of washing their latrines. Another po a very important part of Avatar Mayor Baba's work has been in gathering together hundreds of spiritually advanced pilgrims, known as musts. They are advanced on the inner planes of consciousness, but have reached a stalemate in their journey to God and cannot go further. Baba would often go to any length to contact them in order to help them onward. Baba discloses that these must experience great happiness and are a source of immense good to others, even though at times they display eccentric qualities. Some of it are very childlike in their attitudes. Throughout the years, untold numbers have journeyed over continents from all parts of the world seeking to meet the master in India, the land of his birth. Huge multitudes would gather to spend days or weeks together in his company. Often as many as 10,000 people in one day would come to receive his embrace and love. On such occasions, he would for days be seen giving each one a candy sweet as prasad, a gift of the master. When once a disciple asked him to rest, he replied, This is my rest. Through, though the master has an inner circle of 12 disciples. He does not as a rule call anyone disciple or devotee, but refers to all as his lovers. His lovers live throughout the world. Many have met him, while others await meeting him in his human form. Mayor Baba's personal life is one of strict cel celibacy. He eats little and simple food and does not sleep as an ordinary person. He has journeyed around the world and has been to America six times. During these visits, he gave private audience and instruction to many thousands. His last visit to the U.S. was in 1958. Many, after meeting him for the first time, were heard to come in and marvel at his love. Freely translated, Mayor Baba in English means compassionate father or father of mercy. Mayor Baba is 73 years of age and is now living in Marizad, India. He is presently in strict seclusion, in which he permits no one to visit him or write to him. He does permit one exception. In an emergency, anyone may send a message directly to him in the form of a cable. Mayor Baba asserts that he is the same ancient one come again to redeem man from his bondage of ignorance and guide him to realize his true self, which is God. 
Mayor Baba is acknowledged by many all over the world as the avatar of, of the age. This is a postscript, and it's the story of how this book came about and what Mayor Baba said about it when he received it. This book, The Silent Master, Mayor Baba, was sent to Mayor Baba one and a half years before he left his physical body on January 31st, 1969. It reached his hand on July 10th, 1967, the 42nd anniversary of the day Baba began his silence. The book was put together spontaneously as a summary of many of the most significant events and statements of his life on earth. The original and only copy was sent to Baba with this note. Dear Baba, Lord of Hearts, here is your book because it is made of nothing but you. Your love, your compassion, your eternal truth. I bow to you and all that you are, my dear Lord of Hearts, Irwin. In reply, Mayor Baba had this cable sent. I am deeply touched to receive your heart's love on the platter of your book. It is beautifully done and speaks volumes of your labor of love to please me. I am pleased and proud and happy. My love to you, Meher Baba, Merazad, July 11th, 1967. Later, I received a letter Baba instructed Eretz to write. The following are some excerpts from that letter. My dear Irwin, I confirm having received the beautiful book from you, addressed to beloved Baba. It was offered to Baba on your behalf on 10th July, 1967. Baba was very touched with your love that was wrapped with the book. You timed it perfectly. The book is a fine piece of art. It is a documentary on the ancient one. It is a treasure for the archives to be preserved for posterity. At the top of this letter, I have reproduced Baba's message for you that he sent to you by cable on July 11, 1967. His message will give you some idea well, how well pleased he was to receive your offering of love. Yours lovingly, Erich. Nearly 20 years went by from the day Baba received the book. One day last year, while I was visiting Merizat, where Mer Baba had lived, Erich called me aside and asked, if I remembered the book I had sent to Baba. I said, yes. He said, there is no other book like it. Would you, take, would you take it back to the States and publish it? Then return the original book back here. With the exception of the following pages, the contents of this book has been reproduced as it was when it reached the hand of the God-man, so that it may go from his hand to your hand unchanged. In his love, Erwin Locke. The Silent Master, Mayor Baba, compiled by Erwin Locke, Mayor Baba and Erwin Locke, 1960. This book contains only the quotes of Mayor Baba, given through his alphabet board and hand signs. It is the highlights of his mission as the Avatar. <laughs>